Good morning and welcome to this Student Hub Live event for the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the Open University. And the focus of today is research, teaching and you. My name's Karen Foley and I'll be presenting the show and we have a fantastic lineup for you today. Some of you may have been to these Student Hub Live events before and others may not have. So let me explain very briefly how it all works. These are live and interactive events, so whilst we have a panel of guests coming to the studio to talk about some topics that we've already pre-planned, this event is about your opportunity to ask questions, reflect on some of the research and teaching that our colleagues are talking about today, and get to know other students in the chat box. So for those of you who are watching on our um, Stadium Live interface, you'll notice that there's a video stream, there's also a chat box, and there are some widgets that are popping up. And these widgets are basically voting tools, so you'll see a map, so you can tell us where you are. You'll see a wordle, which is basically three words, and we've asked how you're feeling right now. You can put anything in there, but it has to be three things. If you can't think of three things, then a full stop will do, because otherwise your results won't send. We've also asked which level you're studying and which area you're studying in as well. And those names are the names of the schools, which Damon, who is manning our chat tab, will explain to you in the chat box. So another incentive to go and take a look there. And we've asked if you've been to a Student Hub Live event before. So you might want to put some words in there about how you feel about that. So your chat and your comments and questions will be brought to our studio panel um, by HJ and Damon. So I'd like to welcome them to the show today. Hello. Hiya. Hi. How are you doing? We're just getting started on chatting, which is good. We've been talking about the chicken, so we've heard that's coming up. I can say me and Damon aren't too excited about that because we are vegetarians, yeah. but somehow it is related to a module. Davin tells me that there were frogs and toads on his module, so uh, apparently they try and slip in some interesting creatures. But anything yeah. you want to chat about, it all goes, and we're more than happy to put your thoughts, comments, and questions to our wonderful guests on Twitter as well, at Student Hub Live. I like using Twitter a lot, it's very fun. So if you want to join me on there as well. And we've got our uh, board behind us. I like to put my favorite study tips and questions up there. I'm trying to t cut down on sugary drinks. Last time I was told by uh, some people in sports, that's a very wise thing to do for study. So if you've got any more good tips for me, I'd love to put them on the board. Yeah. Lovely. Well, those of you who used to student have live events will know HJ well, but you may not know Damon who works in the faculty. Damon, would you like to tell our audience at home a little bit about what you do? Um, I work in the communications team in, uh, in the deanery in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, um, but I'm also an associate lecturer, so I teach development studies as well. Um, so yeah, um, I've been around for a while, so any questions about anything going on, just ask. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Davin and HJ. So today, as I said before, we've got a great programme. Let me tell you what's in store for you. We have an arts and culture session where we'll be taking a look at the digital humanities. Then we have religious um, studies, history and sociology all coming together to talk about how they're researching power and belief very abstract concept, so that will be very interesting to see how those are made tangible. We then take a look at politics, philosophy, economics, development and geography, um, and their session from that school is about translating research into teaching, and we're going to take a look at migration, citizenship and chickens. And then lastly, we end up with a fascinating um, session from psychology where we'll take a look at digital mothering. So for those of you who are into social media, this will be really interesting, irrespective of whether you are a mother or not. So all of that will be coming up. You can catch up if you've missed any of these sessions later in the day. But let's crack on and deal with our first session, which is about the digital humanities. And I'm joined by Francesca Bianetti, um, Leah Clark and David Rowland. So thank you for joining us today. Those of you at home will notice that our widgets will have changed and we're asking right now which three words you associate with research and arts and the humanities. So what do you think research and arts and the humanities is all about? And also we've asked you on a scale, where do you see um, the uh, level of agreement or disagreement with the question, computers are a useful way of studying arts and digital humanities? That might change as we talk about things during our session. So can I first start by asking each of you what the digital humanities means to you? Because you're all involved in very different projects, which we're going to discuss today. Francesca. Right. Um, so um, my role at the Open University is to work on digital humanities broadly. But personally, my background is in English literature. So for me, digital humanities means the chance to study on a broader scale. I'm a very avid reader, but even so, there's a limit to how many books I can read by myself. But with the help of computers, I can look through millions of pages and find patterns and information about the topics that interest me. What about you, David? 
Uh, well, not dissimilar to Francesca, really, because I'm, I'm running the Listening Experience Database Project, and we're looking for evidence of people listening uh, over the centuries. So what computers do for me is to enable us to locate those, um, you know, those experiences from a massive amount of literature that exists in databases. And then once we've got it, put it into our own database, uh, we're able to use it to search effectively. You know, if we're looking for particular periods, particular pieces of music, particular listeners, we can just draw that all together in a way that's much more efficient. So really your two key areas are around <coughs> archiving to some extent, collating, mm. storing and disseminating various pieces of data, which we'll talk about a bit later, but, but you're different, Leah. Yeah, I'm an art historian um, and so I think the digital humanities and computers and actually filming can be a way to engage in diverse but also new audiences um, and I think it also makes us think about not only what we do but how we do it, how do we engage with objects and paintings. Brilliant. So we're going to be talking about all of those three things. But first, let's talk about the Reading Experience Database, Francesca, because um, this is a very, very interesting project and we've got a screenshot about it. Can you explain to our audience very briefly what the Reading Experience Database is all about? Right. So it's actually one of our oldest digital humanities projects. We've been going on for 12 years at this stage. We um, collect what real readers across time from 1450 to 1945 thought about what they were reading. I mean, in literature, we teach our students what important readers um, thought, critics, authors, but we want to know what um, people from different backgrounds, uh, different ages, different um, locations um, thought about uh, the books, letters uh, that they came into contact with. And computers help us to structure this data, to make it um, searchable, as David was saying, so that we can ask questions on a much larger scale. Uh, what did women readers read in the 19th century, for example? Um, what are the most popular authors um, across time? Uh, at the moment, in our database, it's Shakespeare, Jane Austen and the Bible. Um, and um, in interestingly, it allows people uh, to collaborate with our research. We have in the database a contribute uh, tab that allows anyone to actually record uh, reading experiences that they found while reading diaries, letters and so on. And so to become part of um, knowledge. Brilliant. Well, let's take a quick look at the um, Reading Experience database and see. You've mentioned two very important points here, which is the ability to search and also the contributions tab. So this is the landing page. And for those of you interested, you can uh, have a look at this on the Student Hub Live website. So what would you like to mention about this particular page? Well, um, as, as you said, Karen, um, the two most important areas are the search, where you can search by book being read, by author being read, by the name of the reader, by period, um, and the contribute page, which allows you to input your own information and to join us, join our community, because uh, it's, the Reading Experience database is only as strong and as interesting as the people um, who question it and uh, contribute to it. So why are you so interested in all these different views? Are you interested in seeing what's popular in different areas or different locations and different age groups? What are you doing with this? Well, um, I, we think uh, within the uh, Open University um, History of Books and Reading uh, Research Group and the Digital Humanities Research Group that reading is one of the fundamental activities that makes us human. Um, but um, we've had a very partial picture of what reading means as it's coming as we've mentioned from the well-known readers the ones who have made their mark whose stories have been recorded and told um, so we want to look uh, at reading across the ages and actually from the first of june we'll be also looking at reading across countries at the moment we're only collecting uk information but from the first of june we'll be starting a new collaboration with colleagues from France, the Czech Republic, the Netherlands, and look at reading across Europe and across languages. So we're really exciting. Is it different than reading in France from reading in, in Britain, um, reading in the 18th century from reading in the 19th century? And what sort of things, if people wanted to contribute, could you just say, I've read this amazing book, what, what sort of level of input would you expect from people to add? So the, if you click on the Contribute tab, you'll be taken through a form 
which um, allowed you to enter information um, in a guided fashion. We're looking for um, reading experiences, so encounters with reading material that have been recorded in books, diaries, letters. At the moment, we're stopping at 1945. So the hope with the new project is that we can take it all the way to the present. But at the moment, if you're reading um, a book, uh, someone's diary, and they mention reading a book, you can enter it in the reading experience database, see what they've read, when, um, the name of the reader. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Brilliant. And Damon has put the link to that in the chat box. So you can follow that link or if you aren't watching live, you can chase up the link on the Student Hub Live website to find out more about it. Now, David, you're doing something fairly similar. And I just sort of, before we talk about the specifics, want to talk about this idea of collating lots of information from real people about lived experiences and, and how meaningful that is. Yeah, well, the problem is, I suppose, <clears throat> excuse me, that most of music history is written from the point of view of the critics, the informed people, the, the opinion formers. Mm. Uh, and those are the sort of sources that people tend to go to if they want to find out about music of the past. What we're interested, just like the, the, lead, uh, the Red database, is how ordinary people listen to music, what impact it had on them, uh, where they listened to it, how they listened to it, and so on. So, so we're focusing on that, which hasn't really been done in the past. Um, but there's a vast amount of literature out there. So our, our project's a little bit younger than the Red Project. Um, we've, we've been going about five years, and we've got about 10,000 entries in our database. I think you've got a lot more than that. About uh, 40,000. Yeah, OK. <laughs> 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 <It's not laughs> <bragging>. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we, we're getting there, but it's taking us time. So part of the source for those entries is, as I said before, we, we're sort of combing large databases of literature and trying to pull out the relevant sources. But we're also getting them from anyone who wants to contribute. Like the Red Project, anyone can make an entry into the database. OK. Well, let's take a look then at the LED, the Listening Experience Database, mm -hmm. and we can see here the home page. Yeah, so on the, on the home page, uh, it just tells you how you can contribute if you want to. Um, so you just, there's a little sign-up um, process that you have to go through and then you can begin to enter uh, listening experiences. What we're after, uh, the real gold dust, is diaries or correspondence that hasn't been published. That would be wonderful. But we're also using uh, published material too. Um, so the, you know, the more personal it is, the better. Now I noticed there that you had um, nearly 10,000 listed experiences in 1,625 different locations yeah. um, and that you had 882 waiting for approval. What is this <laughs> approval process about if you're interested in generating a real lived experience? To what extent is there a critical um, curation of, of the content? Um, well it's pretty light touch actually but the important thing is that it meets the criteria for the project so that it is personal experiences um, of the past that, that have already taken place. We're not looking for people to say, oh, I, you know, I'm listening to this piece, this is how I feel about it. Uh, we want um, experiences from the past. So, uh, and they need to be verified that they're actually real experiences that come from recognized sources, not just something that somebody Also, oh, how do you do that? Uh, well, light touch. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Phone them up and see if someone answers. No, 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 no. We're not that intimidating. No. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So, so why are you collecting all of this data? What, what are you doing with this? Um, well, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, there are many reasons, but I'm just working now on um, late 18th century, early 19th century listening, and. Uh, how do people do it? I, there's one character that really intrigues me is Thomas Twining. And we've got a screenshot here that we'll show you on the website yeah, also. Yeah, we've got a number of Thomas Twining entries uh, in the database. And um, on one that's actually not going to be on the screen, but one that's in my mind at the moment, is where Thomas Twining listens to a, a domestic performance and it makes him cry. So the question is, you know, this, this is 1780. Is that normal for a gentleman in 1780 to sit and listen to music and cry? Um, so we're able to pull in uh, a lot of other listening experiences from the period and see, first of all, whether that was um, a usual thing. Actually, it turned out to be rather exceptional because most uh, gentlemen or aristocrats of that period would just tell you what they listened to or who performed it or where they were. Um, so it's unusual. So then you broaden the, the discussion out into, so, so why was it unusual? What, what was the behaviour expected of gentlemen in that period and so on? So th that, that's the kind of discussion that I've never seen anywhere else before. 
Wow, that's fascinating. Excellent. OK, um, so you're both interested then in capturing these experiences um, from, from lay people or just from the general public and looking at how you can make sense of that both in terms of time and space. But Leah, you're doing something very different where you're almost taking the, the critical aspect and, and thinking about how that can be used to, I guess, get people to look at things in a slightly different way. So it's, it's a very different idea. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one of the main things what we want to do is um, some people actually feel intimidated even going into museums. Mm. So trying to widen and diversify audiences of looking at art, bringing it into the classroom, bringing it into the home and thinking about, you know, maybe it might encourage people to actually go and step into a museum. So the Open Arts Objects Project then, basically, um, is all about, I guess, trying to sort of give students that, that museum experience, isn't it? But not just students. No, I mean, the idea is for the wider public, so they're all open access. Um, and we also have been working with A-level art history teachers because of the new A-level art history speculation and, and um, the kind of idea that actually we need more support teaching resources as well. So we have teaching support materials along with the films. Um, and we've also been you know, not doing films just with us, but we're going um, and, and dealing with uh, museum curators and things like that. Brilliant. Shall we have a look then at an yes. example and then that should hopefully enable yeah. us to make more sense. That so we're going to show you a video now which is from the um, Open Arts Objects um, promotional material. My name is Susie West and I'm standing in Rest Park in Bedfordshire. This is not a conventional object designed to be seen on the wall of a museum or gallery as for example you might see an oil painting. The painting is a full-length portrait of a young woman. She's slightly smaller than life-size, but it's still on quite a grand scale for an Impressionist work. Open Arts Objects is a project from the Department of Art History at The Open University. It offers free, open access films looking closely at works of art and objects. It can be used by anyone who incorporates art and design in their teaching. The objects or works examined cover a variety of media, from painting to sculpture, from installation art to architecture. For the Viceroy's Palace, Lutchen's invented a new Delhi order. But if we look in the interior, we can see this new Delhi order better. And we also cover a vast time period from ancient times to the present. The short films really bring to life the works of art, with each one concentrating only on one object. Today I'd like to talk about this photograph by Sir Cecil Beaton and it's one of a collection of 18,000 photographs by Beaton that we house at the museum. Art history is a discipline that is inherently interdisciplinary, so the films also relate to other subjects such as colonialism, economics and trade. Now the Renaissance certainly didn't have the commercial or technological abilities we have today, but the painting shows that in the 15th century, in Italy, you could still see a Chinese porcelain cup showing and demonstrating that the world has always been in some way global. The films also relate to issues that are relevant for today. They address globalization, national borders, social inequalities, gender and identity. Students are asked to reflect on their own contemporary society in light of what they have learned. We also have a series of films that bring the museum into the classroom. We've had expert curators look at works in their collections, from the Victorian Albert Museum, the Wallace Collection, and even Yorkshire Sculpture Park. My name is Sarah Corson, I'm curator at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, and today I'm going to be talking about Hanging Trees by Andy Goldsworthy. The Open University is renowned for its innovative research, which feeds into many of the films and they built a cast of the inside spaces, the interior walls of the house. They then removed the interior, sealed it off to create this strange inverted cast. We live in a world bombarded with visual images, from advertising to Instagram photos. More than ever, we need the critical tools to assess and understand the visual world around us. So I hope that's given you an idea about the Open Arts Objects project. How about 
talking, Leah, about some of the complexities about showcasing things that are very visible, very tangible, like the sculpture that you've brought in today. How do you go about thinking about how best to convey that in a digital format? Yeah, I mean, one of the most the difficulties in teaching art history at a distance is actually trying to convey things like scale. So yeah. you can only see the size of this because I'm holding it in my yeah. hands. If you just saw a picture of it, it could be large, it could be yeah. small. Um, but also the tactility, right? The way that things feel. And of course, even people going into a museum can't often experience that. We can't touch the objects. Yeah. So in some um, films, we try to do a kind of handling session with a curator who can actually bring something out and, and, and touch it. But it is something that's very difficult in art history to convey unless it's in a film where you can actually see scale. Yeah. So this really is, is about taking some of these objects and, and trying to disseminate them. What is the project ultimately trying to do and where do you see it going in the future? Yeah, I mean, it's about widening participation and, and engaging different audiences to think about the world around them and the, and, and the kind of visual and material world that they engage with. Um, so the next leg of the project is kind of thinking about community groups and actually getting communities to take ownership of local collections. And that doesn't mean a national gallery or a national museum. It actually means thinking about a sculpture on a village green, for instance, or even um, a stained glass in a local church. Um, and also regional museums, you know, there's small collections uh, dotted across the country and trying to get, make use of those rather than thinking you have to go to London to see a work of art. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We've got some time now to talk about more generally how some of these projects are impacting in teaching. So we've seen sort of some of the ways that you're collecting various forms of research and, and using research to help with teaching to some extent. But can we talk more specifically about what these databases and things are doing and how students might experience them within modules um, and add to them, etc., to enhance their learning? Right. Um, so the Reading Experience Database is a part of E334. Uh, literature from Shakespeare to Austin. So uh, within the module, students are asked to go to the Reading Experience database and look for um, how readers from the past have uh, experienced the same texts that they're reading in the present. So they're, they're, and comparing their experience of reading Jane Austen with that of readers from the past. Um, and so they can uh, contextualize um, what they're studying um, in a broader historical perspective. On a slightly different uh, approach to digital humanities, we ask students in A335 Literature in Transition to examine digital literature, so literature produced to be read um, on a computer screen, using the methods that they have learned um, as uh, students of, of literature and culture. So um, it's the, using the digital to study the humanities and using the humanities to study the digital. We've got some questions on our hot desk. Um, yeah, Davin has asked whether the art history department is working on any virtual reality experiences. Well, that's a very interesting question. It's a very question. good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's something I've been thinking about. So um, there are ways in which you can actually digitally reconstruct an object. Um, and then kind of turn it around on your phone, for example. So that's something I think would be absolutely fantastic because it would replicate this, obviously not tactility, but it would give you that feeling that you can actually look around an object on all its um, sides. Um, and another kind of research project that I'm interested in is actually, um, I work on the Italian Renaissance courts. So um, many spaces have been either or not the way that they were, but the objects have all been taken out as well. So thinking about actually how you would reconstruct a kind of courtly space that involved, you know, feasting, you'd have incense burners burning, you'd have lamps, you'd have tapestries, trying to actually, the complexity of experiencing a space, I think is, is something that, you know, we could really um, do, yeah. And to a large extent, I guess technology is really changing the potential to do things. It's changing the very landscape of what we're looking at because, you know, some time ago we could never have augmented or virtual reality. We could never no. have those sorts of ways of looking at things. You might not know that the Mona Lisa was very small, for example. You know, that bringing these things is ultimately changing that very landscape. Does that, is there some sort of element there that's, that's concerning or that, that you're mindful of in terms of how you're shaping some of that context? 
Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things that's happened with the kind of Google Cultural Institute where you can zoom in on paintings is that you can actually see brush strokes that you can't see when you're in the museum. Yeah. So I think that's also about expectations. We go into a museum thinking we're going to be able to do all these things. We're going to be touch, you know, into touching objects, but even actually getting close. And often there's glass that you, you, know, you can't actually even see the brush strokes because the reflection on the glass. So I think it's also about trying to kind of um, think about the different ways that we engage with a work of art, which is sometimes actually through a digital means that gives us something else than what it does that when you're looking at in person in, in person um, mm. yeah and what about from your perspective because again here you're looking at people accessing lay perspectives as opposed to critical perspectives and yet often we're very used to sort of knowing what a good book is why this is you know excellent what piece of text mm. so we're very much used to having you know experts shape really what we're looking at how does including these lay perspectives then add to that and does that change your landscape either of you <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, it certainly gives you a very different perspective on the past and the way that music has functioned in society, from my, my point of view. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you realise, well, I mean, one thing through looking at these listening experiences, you realise how little access to music so many people had. Mm. We, we're used to concentrating in music history on the big centres, you know, London, Vienna, Paris, wherever. Um, but actually there's a lot of people around the country who probably never heard live music from one day to the next. Or it might, if they did, you know, it might have been the singing of nursery rhymes or somebody just playing a, a violin or flute on its own. You know, the access to a range of music is something we're incredibly used to, um, but in the past they weren't. So it does give you a very different perspective on past experience of music. Mm. Yeah, and for literature, I think what a project like the Reading Experience Database brings is just um, how significant reading is to people and has been to people from all walks of life, um, but also how much the experience of reading has changed. Nowadays, we used to reading silently on our own, but in the past, a lot of people experienced reading um, aloud and in groups because maybe they didn't have access to books, maybe their literacy wasn't quite good enough. Um, so there was actually um, a close uh, proximity between reading experiences and listening experiences mm -hmm. uh, in a way. And that's something that you don't get if you just study the critics who had access to um, lots of books, yeah. so usually came from the upper classes, were usually male. Um, so it's this diversity that you just wouldn't see otherwise, and that we think is, is important, is, uh, really adds um, to, to the experience of studying literature. And one of the exciting things, I think, with listening experiences is um, <clears throat> the experience of the new. Nowadays, you know, we, we're used to hearing Western classical music, popular music, music of other cultures from all around the world. Um, but just occasionally in these past listening experiences, you encounter somebody who's hearing something for the very first time. And the, the way that they hear it, the impact that it has on them, is very, very striking. You know, you, you, you get the impression that these days we're just a bit bored with the extent of all the listening we can do. You know, we, we're used to such a myriad of, of experiences. But um, it was something very, very special. I'm thinking of one experience of a guy who had never heard a classical concert. He couldn't get in because he couldn't afford to, um, but he crept up the stairs and listened through the door. And he writes this in his diary, and he was completely bowled over by the experience. Yeah, absolutely. No, because it is so different, and, and I'm just sort of mindful that even now with technology and when you, you know, develop these projects into the future with more current, I guess, you know, aspects, again, technology is really shaping the way that we can listen to things, mm. and even with music, <coughs> and I guess to a lesser extent reading, although, you know, people are able to access different interfaces, that does ultimately change the whole experience of interacting with, with the object. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, in the, in the, from my perspective anyway, in the recording era, we, it's just such a totally different experience. Mm. Familiarity with the breadth of repertoire mm. has grown and grown and grown. But if you go back um, into the 19th century and much before that, people had a very n much narrower experience of mm. music. And I guess to some extent it's that cultural experience of putting things on a record player. You know, there are yeah. things around that that, that are, are surrounding, you know, where you're doing it in what sort of context. Yes, mm. yes. 
So, Leah, um, how are you using some of the... Um, we, we've talked a little bit about how this is used in teaching, but, but how is it used in module materials? Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, some of the films that we've done are based on our own research and also are incorporated into our modules because it's related to things that we've been... Um, you know, uh, writing about, um, particularly in Art and its Global Histories, our new third level module, A344. Um, we have a number of kind of global dimension to the art object, or to the, to the curriculum. So we've been using the films in there, but also they're used sometimes as bridging gaps between second and third level. So during the summer when students, you know, want a little bit of taste of art history, but they don't necessarily want to do all of the kind of um, reading, it, it offers a kind of opportunity for them to get excited about the materials that they will be studying or kind of thinking about art history. Um, and they can kind of pick and choose. There's over 30 films on our website, so they can kind of, yeah, find what they like. That's amazing. And the link to that as well, if you're interested, is on the resources page of the Student Hub Live website, and I'm sure Damon will pop that in the chat um, if it hasn't already been done. Whereas the Listening Experience Aid space is included in the um, Music MA, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. It's actually um, it's included across our curriculum. Mm. Um, so we're just writing a module at the moment on music and technology. Um, so it's about the recording process, the editing process, um, and students actually get to do that themselves. But across that experience of um, recording and editing, there's one critical skill that students have to learn and develop, which is listening. And so we've been able just to use the database um, to, to demonstrate to them that you know this, there are a variety of ways of listening to music, and they can go and uh, uh, look at that, look at the different ways in which people have done it in the past. But at, at the master's level, it's more about how you frame a project, the questions you ask, the kind of um, techniques you use, methodologies you use. So you, you can use the material in a variety of ways. Excellent. Finally, um, I wanted to talk about how students might experience some of this, because often we forget that we do have PhD students um, at the Open University. Um, and I wondered if, if um, uh, Francesca, we could talk about um, how the uh, Reading Experience database is being used and, and some of the experiences of some of our PhD students here. Well, we actually have um, several PhD students who have just completed who have um, done their uh, work studying a particular reader. and so putting data into the reading experience database and then using the search uh, capabilities to um, make sense of what uh, they were recording. Um, but digital humanities is used uh, across um, a variety of other subjects for PhD stu students. So um, one uh, project that we didn't get to talk about is the Pelagius project, which comes from the classics department. And that project brings together different resources about the classical world um, uh, based on the places that they mention. Um, so um, we uh, we filmed an interview with uh, a PhD student Sarah Middle, um, and she can uh, explain just how much of a difference um, working digitally has made to her uh, PhD and how, how it's shaped what she does. Excellent. And we'll be watching that after this session um, in one of our short ad breaks. Um, so is there any concluding thoughts or advice that either of you uh, or any of you would like to share with our students before we end the session? Um, <clears throat> the one thing that pops into my head is just explore new things. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's a, a world of digital experience out there um, that, you know, we're, we're all still getting to grips with. There are many possibilities. So just dig in, find out what's there and try and use it. Yeah, and I think a lot of museums actually have apps as well, so that when you're going around a museum, you can either you know click on a um, a little I don't know what it's called scan thing that yeah, you can yeah, do yeah. on your phone, and QR it will tell you yeah, yeah tell you a lot more about the painting. So there's ways in which you can learn digitally um, that's beyond just the text box that's beside a painting. Yeah, and yeah, for my part, ask questions. We are surrounded by a digital world, and uh, what we're teaching you in um, in your arts modules is how to look at something critically, whether it's a book, a piece of music, mm. a work of art. So uh, employ the same skills on the world that surrounds you, no matter what format it takes, whether it's digital material or 
uh, an old manuscript. There's so much information out there, it becomes quite difficult sifting it through and so it's nice to have some pointers about some mm. practical things that you can go and do um, instead of getting lost on the internet for hours, which is, is a common problem I know for me and many other students. Right, thank you very much um, Francesca, Leah and David um, for coming thank and talking you. to us thank about you. the digital humanities today. We're now going to show you that video that Francesca was talking about, about the Pelagios project. Um, so you can meet Sarah Middle in this video and then after that we're going to be showing you um, a little clip about the BA in music which is new and is generating a lot of interest. Then we'll be back for our next session which is about power and belief. See you in a few minutes.